All right, we are going to continue our series on the Gospel of John, looking at who Jesus is as revealed by John and revealed in the Scripture. And today we come to the fact that Jesus is the outlaw. And we go to John chapter 11, verse 47. The chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come, and they'll take away both our temple and our nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. Oh, you don't know anything at all. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. So, Lord, as we bow our heads and our hearts together, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the things that are revealed to us. And we pray, Lord, as we look into your word today, that you would encourage our hearts, encourage our spirits, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, uh, this morning I was looking at my Facebook feed for a moment, and uh, on the Facebook feed there was a guy that had a camera. I don't know if it was the wisest way to deal with this, but he had a camera and he was just going to various people walking on the street or in a store and say, do you believe in Jesus? And person after person was, no, 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 leave me alone, I'm shopping. Right? No. So what do you think of when you think of the person of Jesus Christ? Do you picture him as a shepherd, you know, with the lamb upon his shoulders? Do you picture him standing in the boat looking at the wind and the waves saying, peace, be still? Do you see him on the hillside teaching the multitude and feeding them with the loaves and the fishes? Do you see him with tenderness reaching out to the leper? and bringing healing to that person. Maybe, as we mentioned, Jesus, you see him hanging on the cross or standing with the disciples saying, oh, by the way, those scars? Yes, come, touch my, my side and my hands and see my feet. See the proof that I have risen. But I wonder, as you see Jesus in your mind's eyes, how many of you saw him with a whip cleansing the temple? Or with a finger pointed at the Pharisees saying, you whitewashed tombs. Outside you look so good, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. When I was a teenager, I had a poster in my room, and I tried to find it, but it was hard to get it up there. But it said, wanted Jesus Christ, and then all these accusations against him. You know, he turned water into wine without a license, you know, he's healing people when he's not supposed to, you know, all these different things. And it reminded me that while Jesus was my Lord and my Savior, even as a teenager, to the religious leaders of the day, they considered Jesus an outlaw, a wanted man, one with a bounty on his head. One time they even sent temple guards way back in John chapter 7 to go and arrest him, but they returned empty-handed. And the chief priests looked at the guys and said, Guys, why didn't you bring him? And they said in John chapter 7, verse 46, No one ever spoke the way this man does. <laughs> you mean he has deceived you also? the Pharisees retorted. And so you see this building animosity towards Jesus from the religious leaders. Now, it was the role of the Sanhedrin to protect the purity of the Jewish faith and to safeguard the temple. There were 71 members of this ruling party, this, this Sanhedrin. It was made up of Pharisees whose primary interest was to make sure everybody, including themselves, kept the law of Moses, all the rules and regulations, not the one, only the ones that God gave, but also the ones that man gave, keep all those rules. And then there was the Sadducees. They were the wealthy aristocrats, and uh, their primary interest was to preserve the order of things, the ability to worship God at the temple. In fact, the high priest happened to be a Sadducee. However, the presence of Rome in the area made their job much more difficult. 
Generally, Rome was fairly tolerant of other religions, of course, unless there was civil discord or rebellion, and they would squash that mercilessly with fierce force. And so when the people all began to claim or affirm that Jesus might just be the Messiah, the Jewish king, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, for that matter, naturally worried. For in their minds, the Messiah was the one who was believed to lead a rebellion and overthrow Roman tyranny. And if that were to happen, well, everything could change. And they weren't wrong. Because around 70 AD, there was kind of a rebellion led against Rome, and Rome came in and squashed it. They lost their patience with the Jews. They destroyed the temple, and they ransacked the city of Jerusalem. So you can imagine the tension and the pressure and the real, th- uh, the real threat that Caiaphas felt as a high priest, as he needs to deal, his, or with, uh, at least to the best of his ability, all these components of Jewish worship while appeasing and reassuring Rome that they were not plotting a rebellion. John Walvoord says, originally the high priest held his position for a lifetime, But the Romans were afraid of letting a man gain too much power. And so the Romans appointed high priests at their convenience. And so that added to the pressure because you were the high priest because Rome said you could be. William Barclay tells us that between 37 B.C. and 67 A.D., 28 different men held that role of high priest. Annas, who is mentioned in the Bible, served from 6 to 15 A.D., and all five of his sons served as high priests in the years following. And in fact, it was his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was the high priest at this time that we're reading this story. And he actually handled the role probably best, and he served for 18 years from 18 to 36 A.D., William Barclay says that this was an extraordinary long time for a high priest to last, and Caiaphas must have brought the technique of cooperating with the Romans to a fine art. And so when news started to flee and flood into the city, what Jesus had done at Bethany, how Jesus brought Lazarus back to life after he had been dead for four days, and how that people all over the countryside were putting their faith in Jesus. Oh, this was a travesty, at least in the eyes of the Sanhedrin. And the high priest called an emergency meeting, not for gathering together to rejoice that that God was able to do such marvelous things. Just think God could bring the dead back to life. How long has it been since since that happened? In the Old Testament, it only happened, well, three times. Elijah brought someone back. Elisha brought someone back. And then there was that poor old guy that died and was thrown into Elisha's tomb. And once he hit Elisha's bones, he sprung to life. And other than that, that's the only times in the Old Testament. The rest are all in the New Testament. And so they should have rejoiced in the fact that, wow, look at what God is doing. They could have seen how this miracle of bringing Lazarus back to life affirmed that Jesus really was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. But instead, they determined that if Jesus remained alive, if Jesus kept doing what he was doing, everyone would believe in him and the Romans would be forced to act. So from that day, they plotted to take his life. It appears that Caiaphas, the high priest, the son-in-law of Annas, it seems that he was the one who had the idea. He says, don't you know, don't you realize, you guys, stop figuring out what to do. We know what to do. It's better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. And then John adds, you did not say this on your own, but as the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God 
to bring them together and to make them one. As a high priest, it seems very, very strange that Caiaphas would treat Jesus, who we know to be the Son of God, as an enemy, as an outlaw, as one to be destroyed. Instead of proclaiming him as Lord, instead of worshiping, instead of serving uh, and, and serving him, they put up wanted posters all around town. Now I wish I could say that everyone who meets Jesus would immediately turn and repent of their sin. I wish I could say that, you know, like that guy with the video camera, that everyone we talk to, do you believe in Jesus Christ? No. I wish people would say, yes, I believe. I believe that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, obtained forgiveness and redemption for all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. However, as we know, many like Caiaphas and the religious leaders seem to think that Jesus is somebody to be avoided. Just mention his name and people recoil. So not just to be avoided, but maybe possibly to destroy. And so what do we learn in this story then that's going to help us as we live in our world where that same kind of spirit seems to be prevalent in society? Well, the first thing we see is that Jesus divides. Verse 45, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, he's speaking of Lazarus, they put their faith in him. But some, they went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. They're little tattletales. Earlier, in chapter 9, we discovered that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. Remember the man who was born blind and his parents were afraid to, to say anything about it, lest they be cast out of the synagogue? So the stakes were high. You wouldn't dare say that Jesus was the Messiah unless you were pretty convinced that he was. Because if you said, oh, I'm thinking about it, they would usher you out the door. All throughout the Gospel of John, John brings us to the place where we come, his readers, to a place of decision. Will you believe or not? When Lee Strobel's wife became a Christian, Lee Strobel was less than impressed. He was an award-winning journalist at the Chicago Tribune. A man who prided himself in being a skeptic. And if somebody ever said to him, do you believe in Jesus Christ? He would be quite happy to tell them, I don't believe in that stuff. I am an atheist. Well, he couldn't quite do that with his wife, could he? <laughs> At first, he, he was afraid that he would lose his wife to the stereotype he had in his head of what a Christian would look like. But he says in his book, the, A Case for Christ, instead I was pleasantly surprised, even fascinated by the fundamental change that took place in her character, her integrity, and her personal confidence. And that sent him on an all-out investigation of the facts surrounding the case of Christianity. And after a 21-month journey of studying the evidence, Lee Strobel sat in his living room and came to the realization that it's true, that the evidence says that Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus is the Son of God. Then he knew that he had one thing to do, and that was to surrender his life to Christ, which he did. And it's a wonderful story of what God did in his life. However, Caiaphas, when he was faced with the same evidence, instead of surrendering his life to Christ, those in the Sanhedrin that were with him faced with the same evidence, they weren't swayed by that evidence at all. They just decided to ignore the evidence. John eleven forty seven. 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? What? What are we doing here? Here's this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, if we let him go on, bringing people back from the dead, if we let him go on healing people, opening blind eyes, if we let him go on like this, then 
everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. In other words, if we let Jesus go on like this, he is going to threaten our way of life. And Jesus proved it. He proved it after Palm Sunday, which he came in and he changed, went into the temple and overturned all the money changer tables. He drove out those who were selling in the temple. Needless to say, that attracted the attention of the high priest and his family, especially them, because you see, when Annas was high priest, he and his son set up these pens outside the temple grounds or within the temple grounds in the court of the Gentiles that there was pre-approved animals for sale. But since the temple was a holy place, you couldn't just use any old money, money with, you know, an image of Rome or Pharaoh or wherever you came from. No, you had to exchange it for temple currency. And to do that, well, there was an upcharge of about 15%. William Barclay says, so as long as they were allowed to retain their wealth, their comfort, position, and authority, they were content to collaborate with Rome. You see, it was not Rome. It was Jesus who threatened their way of life because Jesus said, you guys have made my house into a den of thieves. You are robbers. I am calling you to be men of prayer. I am calling you to be men of honor. I am calling you to be men of God. You are acting like thieves. But isn't that what Jesus does oftentimes? He'll come and he'll call us away from our greed and call us away from our pride, call us away from our willingness to take advantage of people. And he says, won't you serve me instead? In fact, in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, he goes as far as to say, no man can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. But the Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and sneered at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. And so some people will say, I don't want Jesus. I will hold him at bay. Why? Because the cost is too high. And so they choose to hang on to what they have. They ought to focus on this life and not the one to come. Now, if you're a Sadducee, that would be a lot easier because Sadducees, like Caiaphas, the high priest, didn't believe in the resurrection. Remember, later Paul was going to bring up that argument because Paul was a Pharisee. They believed in, in the resurrection. But the Sadducees didn't. So he thought, wow, there's no life after this. We might as well live this one to the full and enjoy it. And you know, there's that thought in our society, isn't there? That we just live the life for this life here. Do I need Jesus? Not really. And so there's a tendency to put him aside. But Jesus says this in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul. And so Jesus brings us to this point, this point where we must choose. But as we will see, Jesus never forces us to choose him. Some people say, well, if God is all powerful, why doesn't he just make us all serve him? Why doesn't he just make us all choose him? No, because he wants us to choose him because we love him. He wants us to respond to his love and his grace. Well, one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest, said, you don't know anything? Don't you realize it's better one man die for the people than the whole nation perish? Again, as a head of Sanhedrin, he was in charge of keeping the peace, of preserving the integrity. But instead of investigating to see whether Jesus really was the promised Messiah or not, he was determined only to prove that Jesus claimed to be the Christ. And if Jesus claimed to be, then he would recommend the death penalty for blasphemy. Warren Worsby says it was necessary that the Jewish council or the Sanhedrin met and discussed what to do with Jesus. But they weren't seeking after truth. They were seeking for ways to protect their own self-interest. We have a good thing going at those, you know, that little bazaar. We have a good thing going. We're making a lot of money. We have a good thing going. And then the fact of the matter is, in their minds and in their hearts, they already determined that Jesus must die. 
They didn't plan to arrest Jesus when the city was full of people because the Passover was coming. And of course, people from all over would, would journey to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They didn't want the people to riot because if that happened, they knew what Rome would do. Rome would step in. Rome would just kind of with their brutal force. And they knew it because the temple, the Antonio Fortress, which was right beside the, the temple, overlooking the grounds, was filled with Roman soldiers. Him and Pontius Pilate, who normally would be up there in Caesarea, sitting by the Mediterranean and sipping whatever he was going to, had to go to Jerusalem during the Passover time with extra forces just in case somebody was going to bring out a rebellion and they needed to march and they needed to put it down quickly. And so this was a real threat. This was the tension in which they lived in that day. And so the religious leaders knew they wanted to kill Jesus, but they wanted to wait until after the Passover. Well, things changed a little bit when a fellow named Judas came up to them, and he offered them a way to arrest Jesus quietly, away from the fanfare of people. And what's surprising in their haste to condemn Jesus is that the religious leaders broke a lot of their own regulations. For instance, in criminal cases, especially those deserving death, they're to be tried during the day, but they'd try Jesus during the night. And no one was supposed to have one of these uh, criminal uh, investigations or procedures during the Passover season. And only a verdict of not guilty could be determined in just one day. A guilty verdict required everyone to sleep on the decision. And the witnesses were to be examined separately, and yet none of those things happened. William Barclay says these were the Sanhedrin's own rules. And it's absolutely clear that in their eagerness to get rid of Jesus, they broke their own rules. Why? Because they were determined to put Jesus to death. He was to be the sacrificial lamb. The one who would die to keep the status quo. At least that's what they thought. Again, that's why John adds that commentary, that he didn't say this on his own. The high priest prophesied that Jesus would come. Now, several commentators note that it was a Jewish belief that when the high priest asked for the counsel of God for the nation, that God honored that and spoke through him. And now, whether Caiaphas realized it or not, his words were profoundly prophetic that Jesus would die as a sacrificial lamb, that he would assume his role as a lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. But it would be on his time. Jesus was, an, and God knew that to be the Passover lamb, he needed to die on the Passover. So the timetable got moved up on them. Now, Paul talks about why this is so important in the book of Romans. He says in Romans chapter 8, 5, verse 18, Consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all man, so also the result was justification that brings life to all man. For just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one man, many were made righteous. In other words, Jesus has come to redeem the people. Caiaphas was absolutely correct when he said one man needs to die to save the nation from perishing. And apart from the work of Christ, the work of redemption wrought through his death and his resurrection, every one of us would perish. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And tragically, Caiaphas and the religious leaders and a whole bunch of people that responded to a video camera, do you believe in Jesus Christ? So no, not me, I don't believe. The last thing we see is that Jesus is in control and he chooses the timing. Verse 54, therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews, 
because there's this death threat upon him. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim, where they stayed, where he stayed with his disciples. See, Jesus understood that the religious leaders were growing increasingly steadfast in their position that he was an outlaw, that he needed to be silenced, even though the evidence overwhelmingly indicated that he was indeed the Christ. Even the religious leaders couldn't deny the fact that a great miracle had just been accomplished. There was too many eyewitnesses. People testifying of the fact that this is what I saw with my own two eyes. Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, he did. And you would think that the religious leaders, again, would be thrilled, but they weren't. Ironically, they opted to reverse the miracle. They wanted to take the very life of the very one that Jesus brought back to life. John chapter 12, verse 9, Meanwhile, the large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there. He was in Jerusalem. This is after, the, uh, after Jesus had come in on Palm Sunday. And it came not only because of him, but they also came to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. And so the chief priests made plans. We'll kill Lazarus too. On account of him, many of the Jews were going after Jesus and putting their faith in him. And so what did Jesus do? He withdrew before, of course, he went that last journey to Jerusalem. He withdrew, not because he was hesitant, not because he was afraid, but because his hour had not yet come. Even before the transfiguration, after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus revealed to his disciples that this is what was going to happen. In Luke chapter 9, verse 22, this is just after Jesus said, who do you say I am? Oh, well, some say you're this, some say you're that. Well, who do you say? And Peter said, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's this occasion. Jesus said to them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day raised to life. Jesus knew exactly what his hour meant. And now the Passover is approaching, and Jesus knew that his hour had come. He even declares it in John chapter 12, verse 23. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And that glory involved Caiaphas' prophecy that Jesus would have to die for the world. He says in John chapter 12, verse 32, But when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. A few days later, Jesus was arrested. Jesus was condemned to die. And what kind of death did he die? He died the death of a criminal. He died the death of an outlaw. Why? To save even the worst of sinners. A few years ago, there was a lady in my office, and we were chatting, and she was struggling to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I asked, well, who do you think that Jesus is? She said, well, I think that Jesus is a good moral teacher, one who performed some pretty amazing miracles. And she's right. Jesus is a good moral teacher. In fact, he's the only moral teacher. He's the only one that completely, 100% lived out what he taught. The rest of us teach, but we have a hard time living it out, right? We teach our children, we have a hard time living it out because we are not without sin. And we do our best, but we fall short. Only Jesus was without sin. And he actually calls us to a higher standard. Remember his Sermon on the Mount? Well, you have heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say, right? You've heard it said, don't kill somebody. But I say, don't even call them names. You've heard it say, don't commit adultery. I say, don't even think about it. Jesus calls us, he ups the ante at all times, and he lives up to it because he is holy God. And apart from him, we fall short. 
which leaves us in a very dangerous place. Well, if we need to stand before a holy God, a God who is perfect holiness, perfect justice, and I have to stand before him in my goodness, <laughs> I'm in trouble. If I have to stand before him in all the, the good things I've done and I start bragging about myself, he'll just look and go, well, <laughs> let's look a little closer. Have you ever been tainted by ulterior motive? like pride or selfishness or greed? <laughs> Jesus performed miracles, each one of them a sign or a confirmation that he is who he says he is. And still, some won't believe, some like Caiaphas, some like those who were videotaped on that videotape. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Oh, we're not stoning you for these, they said, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Mere man claim to be God. And that's what makes you a wanted man. That's what makes you an outlaw. Unless, of course, he really is. Unless, of course, he really is. He really is God come in flesh. And then the question switches. Not from, are you an outlaw? But this question switches to, is he somebody I want in my life? The question switches to, is he somebody I am going to believe in? It switches to, is he somebody I can trust? And all of a sudden, here I'm pointing my finger at Jesus. And then the tables turn. And the finger comes back to me. Will I stand in my own sin? Or will I stand in the forgiveness that Jesus brings? Do I want Jesus in my life? Do you want Jesus in your life? Do you want him to be your Savior and your Lord? The wanted poster. Is it wanted like I want him because he's the outlaw and we need to kill him and get rid of him and the, he's the scourge of society and let's just take anything to do with Jesus and remove it? Or is it wanted as in I want him? Well, if you're here today or you're watching online, I hope that your heart says I want him. I want him as my Lord and my Savior. Well, how does that happen? It happens when we want and we pray. Jesus says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. We can find forgiveness. We can find light. We can find hope in Jesus Christ. I had a neighbor this week. He was talking to me about this world, and he said, boy, this world is getting crazy. You're a man of faith. What's, what do we do? I said, we have to look to Jesus. We have to look to him. He is our hope, and he is our strength. Do you know that hope? Maybe we can pray together. Dear Jesus, I thank you for coming to earth to be our Savior. It must have been difficult when people judged you and accused you of being something that you weren't. Forgive me, Lord, for the times I misjudged you, for the times that I have accused you, for the times that I have ignored your voice. I recognize that you are the perfect son of God and that you died and you rose again to make sure that well, I don't have to perish in my pride and my stubbornness. So I ask you to forgive me. I want you to be my savior. I want you in my life. So today I give you my life. I pray that you would help me follow you all the days of my life. I pray, amen.